Uh, good day from Perth, Western Australia. Um, I'm Percy Asratna from the Institu Institutions of Engineers Sri Lanka, uh, Western Australia chapter. Um, on behalf of the committee and the members of the chapter, I am delighted to welcome you to our seminar series. Uh, this is the fourth webinar of the series for 2022. Uh, this will be presented by Dr. Dimanta Di Silva, Senior Lecturer, University of Mauritius, Sri Lanka. The title of the presentation is A Light at the End of the Tunnel for Traffic Congestions in Colombo. Uh, it is an indication that a long period of traffic in Colombo is nearing an end. Uh, Dr. Di Silva uh, received uh, his MSc in Transportation Engineering and BSc in Civil engineering from the University of Mauritius, Sri Lanka. He completed his PhD in transportation engineering at the University of Calgary, Canada. He processes over 18 years of transportation engineering experience in Sri Lanka, Canada, and, uh, and the US as well. His work includes uh, activity-based transport uh, uh, demand models and uh, special economic land use models for policy testing in macro and micro policy planning. He returned to Sri Lanka to join the University of Moratua. He, he was a team leader developing the Colombo uh, Megapolis Transport uh, Master Plan. Uh, Dr. De Silva has been uh, instrumental in developing the Google Transit for Sri Lanka on Google Map, Maps platform. He's also the core developer of the MTRADA, a software to Google traffic data in transportation planning. He has been a part of all major uh, suburban railway development uh, project feasibilities, LRT feasibilities, and all major road feasibility projects in Sri Lanka. His research interests uh, uh, include integrated land use transport modeling, transport planning, and transport uh, infrastructure uh, management. Before I hand over to Dr. De Silva, may I go through uh, the arrangement in place for today? Uh, Mr. Chamila Priyanta uh, will be managing the overall Zoom presentation from Colombo. Uh, he's the manager of ISL uh, Corporate Communication. Mr. De Silva will be presenting uninterrupted for the next 40 minutes. Uh, you, you can post any questions on the chat board. At the end of the presentation, I'll be coordinating the Q&A session. If all the questions cannot be uh, responded today due to time limitation, uh, we will endeavor to get them responded via emails. Uh, may I now call upon Dr. Dimanta Di Silva to commence the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my uh, presentation screen. Can I get a confirmation of that, uh, Percy? Yes, of course, I can uh, see you. Okay, see you. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> once again, thank you, uh, uh, the, the Civil Engineering Subcommittee of the Western Australian Chapter of the Institute of Engineers, Sri Lanka, for inviting me to make this presentation. Um, and I would say uh, good evening for all the all the people from Australia and good afternoon for people joining from Colombo. Uh, and so my topic I'm going to talk about is on a light at the end of the tunnel uh, for traffic congestion in Colombo. So when the introduction was made, it was uh, like, you know, thinking that there is a uh, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. So let's see whether there, if there is a light at the end of the tunnel or where are we right now, okay? So th the idea uh, to kind of share the knowledge about, uh, uh, about what's, uh, uh, what's actually, uh, what we can do, is it possible? Is that what I want to try to kind of share with you all? So uh, to st start with, so uh, the travel, there are different segments of travel. So when we look at, uh, when we are talking about travel, we can't always have it in one dimension, thinking on, on one frame. So because we have regional travel. Now let's take, uh, for example, in Australia, regional travel is going from Sydney to Brisbane, 
to Brisbane to uh, Melbourne. All these are regional travel, right? And then I mean, in Sri Lankan context, going from Colombo to Jaffna, Colombo to Kandy, Colombo to Gaul, these are regional travel. So the, the characteristics of uh, the way people think, we people behave, we will, we, the way people make decisions are based on these uh, characteristics of this travel. Then we have the urban travel that we talk a lot in, in depth. So uh, which where again the people, the trip lengths are different and people make their choices based on the characteristics of it. The third is the rural travel where, you know, uh, where, where there's not a lot of amount of demand. And so that, uh, you know, you don't have a big infrastructure providing, a, you know, a transport infrastructure for rural travel is would be costly. For example, if you have to provide a bus service for rural travel at a higher frequency, the the government or the operators will have to pay a higher higher price, right? So we have to look at each of these at a different way. We can't put it into one frame and say, okay, we want to provide everything by public transport. That is a wrong idea, wrong approach. When it comes to regional travel, uh, maybe the road travel is the most efficient mode. That is why the expressways, uh, high mobility corridors, high speed railways has come up for regional travel. Okay, So I think, for example, when we are taking about uh, in Sri Lankan context, I take for Colombo to Jaffna, we take there's about 400 kilometers to travel with uh, uh, the, uh, by car. But when you consider the cost, right, we consider whether whether which, which mode is more efficient. So let's take uh, like a bus, normal bus in Sri Lanka at the moment is about no, uh, not the not the super luxury. The normal is about thousand five hundred rupees one way ticket. Then in a super luxury, it's about two three thousand six hundred rupees in for one ticket. So that and when you compare the, the recent uh, with the recent price hike on trains, the train uh, first class tickets about two thousand eight hundred. Now, if you're traveling alone. If you're a one single person, of course, uh, then the public transport will be a, a better choice. But if you're going as a uh, family of say four to five people, uh, then you look at the cost component of each individual ticket, right? So if you do the calculations, uh, it would come up that, you know, going by road, by car or, or a van would be much more economical compared to going by public transport. So it's it's so there, this is why you need to always keep that in mind when you're selecting when you're thinking whether it's which type of travel it's been made. So, but today I'm going to focus more on urban travel, which is kind of where the congestion comes in, and want to talk about how we would should not should be looking at, uh, you know, uh, absorbing it and looking at uh, finding a solution. Now, what is the problem we have? This picture kind of, you know, covers main, main everything. This is on the uh, on Gaul, uh, on Colombo on Marine Drive. You see a train full of people. Uh, very, you know, the train condition looks very, you know, bad. Bad means the quality looks not that pleasing. You see a road network with, uh, you know, a lot of uh, undisciplined drivers lot of three wheelers going without non lane behavior congested so you see the problem in one picture okay so the question is is there a solution what is the practical solution do we have a solution so this is what i'm trying to talk to you and show you how we can get our solution um, so at the end what you would find out our listen is a solution is possible if funding is available and right prioritized approach uh, the prioritization is done appropriately right so these are key things we can't find a solution without any funding if you are going to do some uh, quick fixes and band-aids we will always remain with the same old problem okay um, you know we are in a current crisis at the moment so i'm not not going to talk about the detail what we need to do during this crisis but we will touch a little bit later on and maybe during the QA sessions. 
what I will to show you is within five years. It, now this this takes certain amount of time. Why? The infrastructure development takes time. Okay. S uh, second, the amount of funding, uh, amount of investment we can do at once is limited. So what I have shown is 60% of the congestion can be solved in within five years. So I started this presentation. I created in 2020. Uh, updated after the new government came in to show that we can do this in 2025 but you know two years passed now if it start today which is uh, which is questionable again we can finish by 2027 we can I can guarantee that we can get a complete solution by 10 years right we can eliminate the congestion on the roads and the, uh, of the modeling that work we have done has shown that we can actually resolve our problems in on congestion, urban congestion. So to, to, before we go into the details, let's identify uh, uh, a, a little bit on the mobility of the Western province. Why I'm talking on the Western province provinces, Western province is one of the key in, in, the, in the country. Why? 40% of our GDP comes from Colombo. Or Western province. Uh, six percent, uh, six million people live in Colombo, right? So what we have found is uh, from the only comprehensive study that has been done for the whole Western province is was done by this Comtran study in 2013. What we found was 10 million passenger trips come in uh, are happening within this uh, Western region, Western province of of Sri Lanka. Out of that. 7.8 million, close to 8 million are motorized trips. So still there are about motorized, non-motorized and walking trips happening, especially on, on short distance. When we look at the Colombo city, CMC, what we find is uh, there are about 2 million, 1.9 million passenger trips crossing the boundary each day. So that is coming in and coming, going out. We have seven corridors. Uh, Nigambo, Candy Corridor, Low Level Corridor, Malabe Corridor, High Level Corridor, Horano Corridor, and Gold Road Corridor. So 1.9 million passengers coming in and going out, right, each day. So this is in 2013, and anything that we show, anyone giving a number today would be estimate. So we could estimate that it's about 2.6 million by the 2021, right. What we knew was, the highest uh, corridor, the, the passenger corridor, that is from the Candy Corridor, right? The second behind Candy Corridor was the Malibu Corridor with three, about 350,000 passengers crossing the boundary in and out, right? So average trip length is an important factor to understand how people would travel. Longer the travel, trip length means uh, more distance to cover, more infrastructure needed. Um, the sh uh, then average travel speed is uh, was about 17 kilometers per hour in the region, but going down to about 12 kilometers per hour average within the uh, city limit. So you can see the problem, right? The mode share is an important parameter to kind of understand how efficient your transport system is. What we find is 52% of our modal share is taken by uh, public transport, which is a good number. But the problem has been, it has been gradually decreasing uh, from about 65% to 52%, right? You could see bus is about 48%, rail is only 4%. But when you consider the whole region, this is because the, the, the network length. The bus share is high with about 2,500 kilometers of network. The rail share is with about 200 kilometers of network. So we have to be very careful when you are looking at this percentage. But one, one thing I want to show, highlight is, when you look at each corridor wise, each corridor, whenever there is a rail corridor, now Nigamba corridor has it, Candy corridor has it, Gaul Road corridor has it, each of these has a very high percentage of rail during the peak time. So the peak time where the most of the traffics are coming in, our, Usually about 10 to 13 percent of the total daily traffic is being carried during one peak hour, right? So in that time, um, we have about 40 percent are taken by rail. So the one of the biggest problem we had in the Malebe corridor, which was the highest grow, growing corridor, 
is that it doesn't even have a rail corridor. And the second one, the high level corridor, which the Kalani Valley line is there, the rail was taking only 10%. The reason has been with, with because it had only only one single track and very, uh, you know, very old uh, signal system and then, uh, you know, very bad condition of the railway. So when we look at the planning, it's, uh, it is important to understand where we would be. We don't do our planning only for one, two years. We look at about 20 year horizon. So when we look at the, uh, we, we, we look at some modeling work, we could see that the number of trips would increase to about 4 million, 4.5 million by 2035. We could understand which corridors would have which kind of passenger movements. Now, it's, it's really understood that, you know, when it comes to urban transport, uh, public trans increasing the public transport is the way to go. There's no question, argument about it. Urban travel, when your trip lengths are short, uh, your, your most efficient transport mode is uh, public transport. But the important is, how to select the technologies. There are different technologies that you can use for public transport. So here I'm, I'm trying to kind of highlight how to select and why, what are the parameters or what are the things that you have to consider. So you can consider a modern bus, you can think about going upgrading the, move, uh, the buses, increasing the capacity by selecting BRT or bus rapid transit, suburban rail, monorail, light rail, heavy metros, high speed rail, uh, high speed rail is not for urban travel, more for regional travel. Trams, maglev, now I think what you have in Sydney is more kind of a tram rather than a, uh, a kind of a light metros. So Hyperloop, these are all the technologies that's available. So you need to select your technology based on a couple of factors. One is, one factor you need to understand is the passenger capacity. What are the, what is the passenger capacity each of these technologies? What we call in a technical term is, most of all of you are engineers, so technical term is PPHPD, passenger per hour per direction. A bus can carry, a bus system can carry about 10,000 passengers per hour per direction. That is one direction in one hour, you can carry maximum up to about 10,000 passengers, right? Uh, a BRT system can carry 13,000, right? You can increase from 10,000 to 13,000. A suburban railway, a monorail or LRT can go increase this up to about 30,000 passengers per hour per direction, right? A tram is uh, lower. So a tram uh, with, uh, with this kind of two compartments, it's much, it's much lower. It's ki ki kind of in the bus system, in around 10,000. A metro, uh, which is longer, wider, uh, can take up to about 75,000 passengers per hour. So you need to first under identify what kind of a demand that you expect because you don't want to, uh, you know, invest too much as well. So when you look at it, this graph is a very important graph. Uh, on the x-axis, it has the passenger capacity or the PPHPD uh, for per lane per track. The car and on the y-axis, it has the capital cost, US dollar millions per kilometer if each, each uh, technology. So the bus is, uh, you know, the, the, it's coming to like, you know, less than, uh, like, you know, carrying less than 10,000, like around 10,000. The cost is from, uh, you know, it's less than two, three million passenger uh, per kilometer. BRT is about in the range of three to five million uh, US dollars per kilometer. Uh, the LRTs, which can take about 30,000, is ranging from 25 million US dollars to about 50 to 55. 25 is where, because LRTs can go on the ground as well if, if the space is available. If it is elevated, of course, the cost will be higher. So one thing you need to understand, uh, this is kind of a summarization of it. What we found out in each of our corridors, Nigambogor Road, Parliament and Candy Road, in 2013, this was our PPHPD. Most of our corridors were beyond even at the moment just to provide a solution by bus. What when we found, when we go and find for the 2035, what we find is our corridors are always beyond the buses as a solution and we need to go for urban rail or LRT. And of course, we are really less than the metro. We don't need, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the demands to kind of, uh, to and if we have metros, what we will find is we will have 
empty metro. So this is where we kind of find our technologies, select our technologies. Now, when you look at uh, uh, kind of uh, when you when you do the planning, you need to have a broader, higher level mobi mobility strategy. Now, this I feel this is my vision and this is my thinking that how we should be uh, addressing and this is applicable to any any country as well. Now, a person, uh, uh, you know, we need to provide a person all the alternative of transport modes. And it's up to that person to choose from. You can't put yourself in, in, in the selection because it might be different from another person, right? An uh, older person might want, with, who can't uh, walk easily, might want to use a private vehicle, right? A, a, a female who's thinking security is a concern would want, doesn't want to use public transport. Uh, a, a person in the higher income category or like, you know, based on the social or status or con considering because he has not used public transport before, still want to use private transport. But this is why we want to have, uh, uh, the, we need to develop our transport system to allow a person to use a car or a bus or a LRT or a railway or even a taxi. All these has to be available. You can't only develop the LRT or you can't only develop the bus and ask people to uh, use that particular mode, right? Now we know, second step is we know that the public transport is the most efficient mode. So here, this is where, uh, where we can make the public transport which we want and the non-motorized more attractive options. How do you, you can do it? You can make them faster, you can make them lower cost, Right? You can provide, you know, you can provide it as, as a subsidy. The reliability, you can increase the reliability. Now, for example, when you provide bus lanes or BRT or like you are, you are trying to create higher reliability by providing uh, a dedicated lane. When you have a rail line, you already all, always have that reliability because railway has their dedicated, uh, you know, path, right of way. Sometimes when you have an elevated or a great separation of for railway, you have that you you have you you ensure that reliability, right? Um, and the connectivity. If you have the better connectivity, uh, you know maybe by having the the access to park and ride, uh, the buses, all these, you can make it more attractive. Now, uh, ride rail is more reliable is over the road based transport or maybe it's for car or maybe it's for even for buses, it's because railway has their own right of way. You don't have to, uh, they don't have a conflict of with the other modes of transport. While the road transport has always a uh, uh, conflict with people, um, uh, the, the non-motorized vehicles, uh, uh, like, you know, you know, all the other things like the pedestrian crossings, signal lights, all these have a conflict. Now, once we have uh, the we are so once we have the alternate all the alternative modes, we we provide uh, attractiveness for the public transport. But then we can bring our policies in that will discourage a private vehicle use. How can do it? We can increase the congestion. We can include uh, apply congestion pricing. We can include higher parking fee. We can provide government incentives for workers. Uh, to use pub public transport and this is kind of a push towards private vehicle uh, sorry pr uh, public transport and you know pull out people from private vehicle here if someone wants to still use a car they still can use it but pay the price right the pricing that rather than increasing the taxes uh, for to limit the number of vehicles that is imported to the country you know, you should be allowing people to import vehicles. Why? Uh, it, your, your policy should not be based on the congestion on an urban system, urban area. Because a person living in uh, somewhere in, uh, you know, rural area, maybe Girandru Kote or uh, Polonnaruwa or these areas, they should have a vehicle so that they can come in, go into the, uh, go into the hospital or to the, uh, you know, to do their chores even later in the night. Providing that 
service during the night by a public transport will be too costly because there is no demand uh, to provide a continuous higher frequency service. So this kind of a broader level is important. Now, longer term strategy for public transport <coughs> has to be for Colombo or Western Province is rail based. Rail has to take the majority of the transport. And we can see what's shown here is our rail as the main mode of inflow, right? We have these already corridors where we already have it and new proposals. But then whenever we don't have LRT uh, railway in some of the corridors, that is where we want to provide LRT. Now, a lot of people can try to uh, argue LRT is costly uh, and try to differentiate between LRT and rail. There's no difference. LR, the modern rail uh, system will cost very similar to a LRT system, right? It's pretty much the same. It's the same technology, right? It's a rail-based technology. Only difference is the amount of, uh, if it is electrified, the amount of electricity is actually used higher in the railway. LRT is low, less. So, you, you know, it's, it's very similar. It's something that is very, uh, you know, something you known to Sri Lanka. So that is why one of the reasons that the, the, we change from monorail to rail, right? The, uh, the, uh, the advice to change from monorail to rail was basically on that and several other factors, which, is, which I'm not going to go into detail today. But once you come into a city, you still need people to circulate. So this is again, your, uh, once you come along the corridor, you need people to circulate. And that is why you need to have a good connectivity within the city and LRT can provide that uh, circular system in the Colombo. But what about buses? Now buses are, have been actually providing the main inflow into the into the city. Now but the bus has to change their role. They had to change as more feeder buses, right? And also the buses can provide the city circular systems where you can go into your neighborhood, pick people, bring them into the rail station and the train brings them uh, because it's more efficient. They are bringing into the city, buses actually travel less and less all along the corridor because they are more efficient. And when you take into Sri Lankan context, uh, the people, the bus operators makes money also in for the first first kilometer, because at the moment, I think it's about 32, kilo, 32 rupees per kilometer. It used to be about 12 rupees per kilometer, right? At the, for the first kilometer, first break. So this is where the buses have to change. Or of course, then we need to have our multimodal centers, multimodal, uh, you know, provide the seamless connection with 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 the of inter with these all these modes. Where are we today? Okay, this is a nice cartoon that I saw in morning paper. We are asking people to use bus lanes. We are asking people to use park park and ride. What you see in this picture is exactly what is happening right now. The buses is so full, the trains are so full. No, it's no point providing uh, 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 without the capacity available in this uh, in this context. Now, why we can't? Why we need urban rail or LRT? Why bus alone does not have the capacity, right? So I told you that it's about ten thousand passengers per hour per direction. How this number comes up with? With, with the capacity of about 60 passengers per bus with the number of buses, right? So what I showed you in the previous cartoon is that even if you want to move car drivers out of the cars and put them into the buses, the buses don't have the capacities. You could you sh show that, you saw that when I showed the uh, number of people in each corridor, they were close to about 10,000, which is the number of uh, num maximum number the bus can take if you go out today uh, into colombo and try to get into a bus in the peak time bus is totally full then one can argue why can't we increase the number of buses we are already running uh, about 180 to 200 buses per hour in the peak time and this is the maximum we can run the reason is 180 buses per hour means a bus every 20 seconds a bus every 20 seconds, right? You'll do the calculation and find. So that means every, every 20 seconds, a bus comes to a bus stop. 
and if the people getting uh, in and getting out takes more than 20 seconds the buses pile one behind the other and that is when if a if a system where the bus drivers is are uh, disciplined now what happens P buses come and overtake the other cut across each other so this is where the inefficiency comes in so we are not in a position to increase any number of buses so this is where why we need to go and increase our capacities in our urban rail system so let's look at some of the solutions that we looked at now this was the Panudra Veyangoda line um, then Ragama line then Kalaniveli line going across the uh, the city it's very it was a project that was already you know ready to be done unfortunately uh, this uh, the funding was available with ADB was to was to start in 2020 finish in by 2025 unfortunately uh, different people groups went against and stopped that project and unfortunately I have to tell IESL has a hand in this IESL transport committee in Sri Lanka actually gave a wrong advice uh, saying that this line is not needed and the cost are in higher so many interferences so I have done uh, separate uh, you know videos about it uh, we can go into those details uh, if needed but unfortunately uh, this is the case the railway lines on this or uh, ADB funding was also available Panduru Veyangoda line as well right but the priority was first the KV line then you look at the LRT network this was the master plan developed in 2016 this was the kind of the network we were looking at in in 2016 but then eventually it went to four lines uh, what we call the Jaika line or the Malabe line that was also stopped uh, was supposed to start in 2021 uh, detailed design was ready tenders tender documents are ready it was supposed to start in uh, September 2021 and completed by end of 2024 it was supposed to start from uh, Densil Kobakaduma uh, sorry uh, Ma, the Chandrika Kumartunga Mawata and come all the way up to Peta or Fort but then this red blue green line was uh, you know developed out of this line so this actually came I, I will talk to you about it later these what were considered are, as a private public partnership right so one of the things that even LRT I, I have been promoting the LRT saying that we need LRT but here with these red blue green lines with the PPP I, I, I my recommendation or my understanding what they went overboard the the people who were looking at it they were expanding trying to expand it uh, unnecessarily to areas where there were no demand going to into this area you know a lot of us are you know University of Morutua students you know how many people travel on this road right how the the buses go right how can you put a train along or a LRT along this in front of University of Morutua and expect people to have people in that train right in the buses are empty okay so you no know, like you know you can't it's not feasible and so these sections are not feasible in my opinion also there were multiple sections that were competing with the railway it's unnecessarily for example the, this is from Delkada to Kirulapana uh, Pannipitiya to Kottava uh, Dematogoda to Kalania all these lines were kind of you know having running parallel to, to a railway line you don't have mass transport railway line parallel to each other okay so I think this is also not needed so in my opinion what what is the what is the LRT network that we need I feel there should be only two networks one is the Jaika LRT that was considering that can extend it to Kaduela right and then also was actually part of the um, uh, the planning was to extend it to uh, to Kaduela and also extend it up to Kottao to connect with connect it with the Kalini Valley line then these <coughs> black lines are all the Kalini Valley line or the railway lines then the red line uh, can actually should only start from Kadavata should not go to Ragama uh, they should have a uh, you know have a kind of a loop providing that loop within the city and have can connect near the Ingurukade junction 
why I, and you can provide the inter uh, interchanges available in this location so people coming from the coastal line can get off from here get into Kirulapana someone wants to go to Bataramulla can get out at, at here someone who wants to come from do uh, you know he can go from this way to Bataramulla so you can have that connection coming someone coming from Kalini Valley line can get off at Kotawa and come to Bataramulla so you provide that kind of interconnectivity and transits and it is easy to run as two systems because normally a railway system goes as uh, with efficient with about 30 kilometer network. When you looked at the Jaika LRT, initially the cost per kilometer was kind of higher because it was a relatively shorter distance. But because the system cost, communication cost, all these are uh, same for a system up to about 30 kilometers. So the, when the system is extended, your per kilometer rate comes down. Now, when we did some modeling work, what we found is that this is the uh, existing number and where we can go up to by 2035. The KV line can is, is has a demand about 201,000, about 200,000 passengers per day. Coastal line currently taking about 100,000 can go up to about 400,000. Main line, you know, same. LRT. Uh, existing we don't have but we can go up to 300,000 PPLRT it's about 183,000 and so on this is where our modeling actually we understand what our demands are and what we find is we can provide about 50% of our uh, demand passenger demand can be supplied by rail and LRT itself now what has been done with buses now uh, bus priority lanes was tried 400 million was spent, right, on marking these lanes and also uh, on this section, this black section, Borello to Maradana, uh, road widening was done so, uh, and all together about 400 million was spent on that. So some lanes mark in the evening, not used at least once. For example, uh, from Maliban Junction to Morotua, this section, there was a lane mark on, uh, on, on south direction for the evening peak, not once, sing, uh, like it was not used at least once. Ayodhya Junction to Poldua, again not used once. So tried multiple times, have failed to produce the promised results. And it's not practical in Sri Lanka. One of the main reasons is if you look around these corridors, <clears throat> there are multiple by roads coming across and uh, connecting the main road. It's not like our the usual arterial roads that we find in uh, countries like Australia or Canada or US. Uh, our, our, like, you know, although we can think that Gaul Road, high level road are arterial roads, they don't function as arterial road. So one of the things that practically was the problem was, second problem, this was on Parliament Road, we were monitoring uh, using the Mtrada software that we have developed to monitor the speeds on the road. Uh, I will talk about it in a short while. We could see that what happened before and after the bus priority lane. The average speed went uh, down. The travel time increased mis uh, after the bus priority lane was introduced. Why? This is, this is, you know, this is a very simple calculation for a transport engineer. Because whenever you're, you're running almost at the capacity of that road, right? This is the number on the parliament road, about 5,500 vehicles per hour. It is taking about 1,400 vehicles per each lane, capacity with a, about 1,500. We had a reversible lane on this parliament road. But if you provide bus, that's about 200 buses, you're converting about 1,000, <coughs> about 1,000 vehicles into the other lanes and you are going over the capacity. So it's very easy to know that when the first day of operation it will take, it, it will be chaos. And then you need to understand your speed will go up to about less than 5 kilometers per hour. So you need to understand how long it will take and what is the amount. To go back to this level of 1,400, you need to about 25% of people from cars have to shift to bus. Now the other question I showed is, does the bus have capacity to take that 25%? So whenever you want to look at these kind of a things, you need to really look at whether you are doing, doing the right thing. The BRT has uh, 
five uh, components, dedicated bus lane is needed. Specialized station is needed. You need a uh, you know, specialized uh, station like this. Specialized vehicle is needed. Intelligent transport system is needed. Operation management is needed. But with the BRT, you are only increasing your passenger capacity by 3,000 because you are taking a normal bus system out and replacing it with the BRT. So it is uh, even in Gold Road, we found what was found out was about 12.5 million per kilometer just because uh, elevated road was needed between or road widening was needed from uh, Maliban Junction to Dehiwala. So, it, so this would be in the world's highest cost BRT. It's impractical. So, but what we can do, we can take these two components out, which is not practical for Sri Lanka. Bus lane is not practical. Providing bigger stations on the middle of the road is not practical. But we can go with this these three components, specialized vehicle, intelligent transport system, and operation management. And also, recently, this Sahasara bus reform, this name or, or, or the branding has been tried to be promoted. It was uh, saying that mitigate the competition among the bus operators. The idea behind was to collect the revenue to one pot and distribute based on the kilometers travel. Yes, good concept, if we can do it. So far, the, the, the proposers have failed to show how the per kilometer is rate is calculated. One of the problems for that is, you know, when you take this Gaul road, the 100 route goes all along the corridor. But there are route, they make a kind of a higher rate. This is just a, uh, you know, interpreted, you know, not the actual values. They may be making about 100 rupees per kilometer. 255, that comes from uh, uh, Kota and stop at Galkisa or Mount Lavinia, they are making at a lower rate. Another route, 154, they are making about 54. So coming into one rate, agreeing on the one rate is where the problem is, where, because they are a, a common section. So this Sahasara has had a project unit for last four years. It has been funded, uh, you know, the, the, the consultants have been paid, then this uh, the project unit has been there, but nothing has been coming out uh, from this project. So I, I like you know, this is where we need to understand that something has to be practical, and the stakeholders has to accept it. Then the park and ride that has been started uh, in 2009, uh, 2022 they started, and very recently they started this. They have selected four routes. Uh, some of the mistakes that were problems in the previous. Uh, park and ride initiative in 2009 where it was only on one corridor was corrected we think we by having multiple routes uh, sorry multiple routes and connecting it and also one of the biggest problem was the lower frequency um, you know because even today even even previously the city bus that was promoted it was sent every 30 minutes so people don't actually travel when you don't have free, you don't change. So this has a direct impact on the demand. So park and ride, if it has to succeed, it has to provide that, uh, you know, uh, the, the right route connections or uh, the frequencies and so on. So if bus priority lanes, BRT, Sahasara, all these are failure, what we, can we do? What is the solution? So some people have tried to say, okay, these people, or oh, I don't have a solution for buses. But our, pro our solution for buses in short term strategy, we should have a branding. City bus can be one. Colombo Metro bus is, can be one. We need to go for these low flow, air conditioned, high flow coaches. We need to have a network rather than one corridor. So, this is we need to cover all our main corridors. We need to go to inter corridor and we need to uh, connect it with the short term. The best is to actually go with the separate company within CTB probably, uh, because this has to go with a cluster company concept. But then invite the private public partnership through the invite the private private sector to invest on a bus uh, as a return of investment, because at the moment each bus owner is an operator. It's, uh, you know, very few people would have multiple buses. So each of them is operator themselves. But what has to happen is we need these private sector buses investing on, but they need to invest on the bus only rather than investing on uh, being an operator. 
so if uh, we can start with ctb because 40 percent of each root is is eligible by uh, ctb we can start with because we can't increase any more buses if you are going to with its higher quality bus service we won't have to take away a uh, number of buses out existing buses and include the new buses and we can include implement it in stages 10 percent of the fleet can be in the first year uh, every year we can add because the, you know, the cost the ticket price has to be higher uh, because it's with, with a higher quality right low flow and high flow has to be provided because some high flow coaches uh, buses should be provided because you can, some of the routes you can't have these low flow buses running so this is an interpretative this is just for Marle Bay corridor if you are going with gold road corridor Marle Bay corridor uh, what I found is it, a 15 minute interval we can do with about 100 buses right we should have a kind of a upper circular and lower circular, circular uh, a, a kind of a network as well we need to have this park and ride outside the uh, the city and so that people can park the vehicles and come in and this is a kind of the option too where we can have a wider network as well and the city circulars that once people come in they can circulate in the city and the and the corridor that I talked about these corridor lines can work in the mornings now this is short term because until our rail system LRC systems comes in okay the then once they come in, they can they can actually run um, higher frequency coming into the city, and because the the vehicle is owned by the cluster company, they can operate the same buses in higher frequencies in the during the daytime, so that people in the city can actually travel within the city as well. But long term, the 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 bus rerouting has to ha happen, and bus feeder system has to come in. Because that means buses should not go along parallel to our rail line. There should be more feeders coming and collecting people and, you know, bringing people into the rail stations, right, as I talked about. And also, these buses can come as, as city circulars in the, in the midday period, right. But then these are, these are to be converted along with the upgrade of the railway line, the LRT line, right. So, you know, studies required can be started immediately. Now, uh, uh, so I will take about another 10 to 10 minutes or so and very quickly go to, now we talked about the longer term things that we need, the capacities or uh, infrastructure that is needed to actually you know, provide the uh, solution through public transport. What are the other solutions that we can give? Cashless ticket, smart ticketing has been talked about, still not done uh, a lot, okay. Real-time public transport, Google Maps. Now, this is something we already developed three years back. Uh, all the railway lines uh, the, uh, in, the, in, in the country, all the Western province buses, and all the, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the NTC long distance buses. And also, uh, actually today, up to uh, recently, the Southern province bus, uh, buses, bus routes, about 150 routes were included. Now, this was in 2019. But unfortunately, uh, we were supposed to uh, kind of expand it to other provinces, which has not happened. And also, uh, uh, the, the real, what we have right now is the static information, what is available on the books. So it's, it's not updated with the, the real time. Now, this is some statistics about, uh, uh, you know, in 2000, early 2022, we have about 1.2 million users of this system of the google transit google maps uh, of using the google maps in colombo in, in in sri lanka so that comes to about 175000 to 200000 uh, users per day and we need to go to real time only thing is what is needed is we need a gps enabled vehicle a control center we can start with the railway lines 370 there are uh, about 1,100 NTC buses, ex existing buses enabled. Um, uh, what we get is something like this, where we can say, okay, uh, the bus stop at here, it will be early or it will be late. So we will have that kind of a uh, trip update, service alerts, and also uh, with the vehicle tracking on the map, it is at the development stage. So it's not available with the Google. Now, 
why are we looking at the google is that google is actually a application that's been used widely all around the world okay now this is other short term strategy that uh, is we, we develop something called mtrada software and this is based on google traffic data without going on to the road we were able to identify where our bottlenecks were we can find any section not only on sri lanka anywhere in the world the google the mtrada platform was tested in uh, japan as well uh, hopefully we can do some work in uh, australia as well so any road section um, we can find every one minute we can find the uh, the speeds okay and uh, okay, uh, sorry so that's that's something that we can use these have been developed by the university by my team and uh, uh, like you know co developed by my uh, myself and one of my students who's actually in australia these days completing his phd the soon to be dr sakita kumarage so sakita probably is in the uh, in the audience today but uh, he's the one who brought this idea how we can use it and we have developed into Uh, um, a software that we can use in lot of our work in in our transport planning um you know you something that you probably know don't know is our signal systems have not been updated sometimes for 3 years so this is something that we need to update uh timing update every 3 monthly using the google traffic modeling that i talked about uh manual control by the signal Uh, signals by the police we can do a vision based update on site as well uh now this is where the mtrada was used because we can use identify the queue lanes at a junction by using the google traffic data as well okay um the traffic monitoring is something again that can be used to kind of check okay wh where are the problems are where are the queue lanes are happening and also the cctv monitoring could be used for the traffic management and this is where we know we introduced the reversible lanes on the parliament road we used the simulation to identify we did the work but unfortunately this was now about probably 4 to 5 years back even even more 2017 if i can remember so idea was within 6 months we won't we will go to this kind of you know you the people you in australia you know these systems this is what we should have gone but unfortunately uh, we have not moved into this uh traffic law enforcement is an important factor we need we can increase our road existing road capacities by having cctv monitoring rather than you know catch the people on while they are breaking the law and send the ticket to home so rather than manual we can go to automated uh you know different types of violation has to be identified uh this will increase the traffic safety will reduce the traffic congestion right a pilot study was done proposed in 2016 it was only need so 10 location only needed 75 million unfortunately uh, this was not implemented so lane law enforcement was done uh, unfortunately again without the manual process of people police officers being on the road is not going to work now this is again using the mtrada we were able to capture and check as a help for police to see what the progress was this is dotted line was without the lane law and this was the the, the blue line was with lane law. so there was a marginal increase in speed you can see the speed has increased but suddenly at 9 o'clock this extra lane the reversible lane was stopped so that the the vehicles to the parliament could be sent and then you know that was the chaos and that was the end of the uh, lane law enforcement so the problem is we only increase a very marginal level so the effect with manual labor is not going to work so you need to go with cctv monitoring and so on right traffic incident management uh, so i'm think i'm running out of uh, time so i'm quickly going through this um and uh you know the toll we can use the toll revise the tolls so that we can actually make more people use the expressways one of the problem with the use of the lowering the toll is that we don't we don't have uh, our manual ticketing on the tour, on the expressways so one of the prerequisites is we need to go the e toll for that rest areas for expressways Uh, to look at the safety side 
Now this is something that we have put very recently uh, and uh, on, on the Central Expressway. This is the rumble strips. Uh, you know, people in Australia should be knowing this, right? For, so that we can alert the fatigue drivers, right? Now this is something that I have done in, uh, in Colombo, in schools. Uh, you know, we see a lot of, uh, you know, congestion near the schools. And what we did was we gave a solution by having a parking restriction, a quick drop-off area, short-term parking, enforcement. This was done near Vishaka in 2015 and followed by at Musius in 2018. What we did was uh, uh, very uh, near the gate, <clears throat> we had a pick-up and drop-off location. We provide a short-term parking so that some children could... Some parents can drop the children off uh, to the gate within three minutes and come back. We provide uh, information to the parents, right? And uh, this is uh, how, just a small video to show you uh, how it was. This is before, this is before implementing, right? I will try to go through, uh, I will try to, uh, you know, f fast forward a little bit, right? So we provide these drop off areas, we mark these areas, and just to show you how it is right now. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is after implementation, the right next day. So simple interventions. Now this is today, uh, you know, how it is happening now. You could see that it's functioning very nicely. Uh, and you don't have, you have this three minute parking. You can park and get into the gate and drop off the child and come back. Uh, you have, uh, you, you have the, drop off areas you can quickly drop off and leave so these kind of things can be done easily to other uh, schools as well now this is a, another application that's been developed a parcel mugger so that we can actually the parents can find school vans so this is something that uh, you know has been implemented highest quality school bus services um, uh, you know separate uh, you know with a higher quality service three wheelers uh, with uh, you know three wheelers are not regulated in the country not the school vans not even the office vans so these are things that can be considered right now finally i would like to come into the uh, non-environmental -envir sustainable transportation that is the bicycle paths and that we've been talked right but recent study that we have done showed that now these are the things that the pedestrian the, the, the cyclists actually look at one of the things the most important thing that they have said is they want a ha having a smooth non-slippery riding so this is was uh, you know consistent with other countries where you do have snow and so on but m the main thing they would ask is they want a riding a dedicated cycle pathway free of pedestrian or any other type of traffic that is the most important thing they are looking at. Having lighting, uh, uh, having, uh, having overpasses to o avoid complex intersections, uh, uh, you know, having uh, secured parking, then having shaded trees, and likewise, we, we were able to identify what are the important factors. Now, this is a picture where in, one of, in Canada, and this is the picture in Sri Lanka, right? Now, just by providing a cycle lane on the road, we have seen that cycle lanes have been promoted. But can we get from our home to our main road? How safe it is? Right? So we have to be very careful when we are promoting it. Unless our road speeds are going to come down to about 30 kilometers per hour, we are actually making the cyclists vulnerable. So we have to be very careful providing the right service. And if we are going to promote cycling just because of the petrol or the fuel crisis we have right now, we are going in the wrong direction. It should not be the reason. The reason should be that the, you should be looking at the cycle as a short distance a trip, not 
for to two to five kilometers so, and then make them safe for big people. We should be looking at a cycle sharing system somewhere in areas you have the infrastructure. For example, in Colombo area, you have the ro wider roads, you have the wider pedestrian paths. You can look at this kind of share. And we are actually doing a study at the moment at the University of Morotu to see whether we can actually promote within the University of Morotu. Now, final two slides. I have talked a lot of details of what we can do. And let's see what in this within five years, what can be done, the short term projects that we can implement. 50% of this whole area can be converted by the modern buses, higher quality. If KV line or the Jaika LRT comes in, extended to Kaduvela and Malabe, bus feeder routes to Jaika LRT, you could see that this whole area highlighted here is provided by complete solution through public transport. You don't have to rely on uh, private vehicles at all. That is one reason that the KV line was prioritized uh, over other two lines as well. Central, like, these are road expansions that are planned. With them, we can actually find about 60% of our traffic congestion can be solved with this kind of a network. This is because we can't do everything all at once. Then what we can do, we can convert the, by with 10 years horizon, uh, you know, the 100% of the bus fleet can be converted to the quality, higher quality bus fleet. Why I said, uh, you know, do it gradually is because uh, you no, know, the price has to be increased so that the gradually we can, the, like in the first years, you know, there's 90% of the buses with the older buses for the people in the lower income to use it. So they can get used to the uh, service. So second year, uh, that's 20%. Third year, 40%. Likewise. So eventually we are converting into 100%, allowing people to convert to the quality bus. And we can also observe whether these buses are getting the demands. Railway moder modernization of all the lines, the PPP LRT can come in. in. Once these LRTs, the railways, buses are provided, that is when, when we can actually provide the congestion pricing and the parking fee strategies can come in. And that is where we can have our complete solution. So with that, I would like to uh, you know thank everybody for listening. And uh, I hope that, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was uh, informative and I am ready to take any questions you have. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dimansa. I think it's a very informative session. Um, uh, we all, almost, uh, the one hour has gone already, uh, but if uh, uh, we would like to get some questions from the audience, if, if somebody need to ask some questions, now we can start it now. Hello, can you hear me? Ah, yes. Yeah, actually, I have, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Doctor, uh, for your uh, lecture. It is very useful for us. Uh, my question is mainly related to the uh, technological obsolescence we are experiencing in uh, this kind of, uh, you know, new transportation systems. Uh, when we bring these modern uh, transportation networks into our countries, uh, it is uh, it is coming along with the sophisticated technologies, which is Hello, subject to uh, which is subject to uh, technological obsolescence in terms of the softwares and the spare parts, and eventually uh, the authorities or the or the government will have to spend huge amount of money uh, for upgrading the systems and uh, go behind this proprietary system owners. So what is the solution in terms of, you know, addressing this technological uh, obsolescence uh, aspect? Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you. I think the question is a valid question about the, the you know, obsolete of the, te the, the technologies. Now, this is where, uh, now, when you are looking at, uh, you know, like, you know, the rail systems, this, uh, you know, these are not, I, do, I don't think they get obsolete. I think it, what, what happens is uh, we need to go into the modern technologies, right? And uh, I feel we need to absorb that. And I like part of the funding has to be allocated for that. And that is where the training has to come 
uh, to kind of uh, the the for example the Chaika LRT and also the Kalini Valley uh, the or the suburban railway, the part of the capacity increasing of in in local context was uh, was part of it. So the the people were trained in Japan to kind of uh, to understand these technologies and to use of their technologies. I think. Uh, you know, we, we can't, we will have to have, uh, we will have to have the spare parts, we will have to have that. But that, that it's part of the maintenance, uh, you know, how plans that you prepare and your financial plans has to be kind of prepared with that kind of in mind. Yeah, I think uh, Jaffa smiles, uh, raises his hand, he can, uh, you can uh, unmute and ask the questions from the Dr. Bimantha. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much for such a comprehensive uh, presentation, Dr. Devinda. Devinda. Uh, yeah, Devinda, I'm sorry. Um, I'm personally uh, located in Canberra, Australia. Anyway, uh, now during uh, this uh, your comprehensive study for the Western province, have you considered a, a transportation master plan for the Western province for 2030, 2040, and so on? Because what happens in uh, the Western province, uh, the, uh, the sporadic random approval by the planning authorities to build uh, condos in uh, a highly residential area and narrow uh, roadways is creating another factor for traffic congestion. Because uh, in overseas, what we used to do, these uh, we used to do, each and every developer has supposed to do a traffic impact study. And this traffic impact study has to be hooked to the transportation master plan. Only then we will know what is the, for the master plan, how many, what is the traffic number, what has been considered for that particular area or particular corridor. The number two, also in that uh, transportation master plan, we will also have to look into have uh, something called safeguarding of uh, right of way. That is to create new right of ways or to amend and create additional lanes and so on. Third is also whether it's been considered to set up a, a TMC, uh, Transportation Man Management Center. Over to you, Dr. Dima. Yeah, okay. So uh, first question is about the master plan. Yes, uh, we, there were, you know, what has been happening is we have several master plans, you know, in 2014, Comtrans did the master plan, then that was reviewed and changed. And then in 2016, we had the last master plan for the Western province that was called the Megapolis Transport Master Plan. That is where I came in and I made the transport master plan with my, my team. Uh, but the problem I see is that the implementation and we have we lack of that. And that is what I'm trying to show. We don't like, you know, we, yeah. we, we know what needs to be done and we we don't actually go and implement it. Right. Uh, I think yeah, there's a nice exactly. saying by Walt Disney saying that, you know, the way to get going is to get started. Right. So I think stop yeah. talking and get started. So I think this is something that we need to do. So I think uh, the master plans are there. It's developed. Um, but for a transport master plan, you need to have a structure plan, how the development is have to be, where your yes. residential areas exactly. are, where is your, uh, where yes. is your other uh, industrial or office buildings are. And that has to come from urban planners. Yes. And with that, the transport yeah. planners can actually give a solution. That is exactly what we did with the Megapolis transport mm -hmm. plan, because mega, based on the Megapolis yes. development plan, we develop the transport plan. Yeah. Then the second question on your yeah. on the uh, on the apartment buildings and so on, there is a, a TIA process in in Sri Lanka as well. But the T, T, mm. uh, uh, but I think the TIA process has to be reviewed, uh, where you do a TIA for everything, or whether you want to do it into the uh, the area the buildings that has a major impact on the road. So I think um, mm. T, T, uh, the, the, there are TIAs for definitely. The third hmm. thing was, uh, I can recall, uh, uh, TMC. 
yeah we don't have that tmc transportation arrange no we ah. don't have that unfortunately one of the biggest problem in sri lanka is that we have uh, you know the road authorities under highway ministry the trans until re very recently highway and transport are in two ministries so transport is even even transport ctb the railway and the national transport commission is under the transport ministry but the 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 provincial buses are in the provincial authority so there's not integration my god so and mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion i think the highway ministry transport ministry and the urban development should be under one one ministry so that we can have a synergy in, yeah. in our planning yeah thank you i agree with you yeah yeah, yeah okay well, um, thank you so much yeah i would like to give the uh, next opportunity to asela galapatige Uh, who written uh, his questions on chat chatbot he asks uh, have we quantified financial saving and benefit to the economy by improving uh, for example 10% of congestion reduction yeah i think we have uh, all like you know we can not the financial saving we are looking at more the economic saving right because when you are looking at uh, the when we are looking at the project we are we are looking at one what you are looking at is the economic saving travel time saving travel cost saving now this is something that is been interpreted very incorrectly most of the time whether a, a, a transport sector development has actually uh, been paid off now if we if you argue on the same same con, uh, you know idea none of our main roads non toll roads is actually giving you any financial benefit none of the bus stops none of the cost that goes to the bridges are are we in financial feasible so i think this is where uh, you know what we have to be careful is whether we are actually getting a uh, uh, economic benefit and with the travel time and travel time saving and travel cost saving uh, of course uh, uh, this has been done we can looked at we have each project that we do this this are uh, been done economic analysis uh the lrt was about 20% eirr uh, in, in economic uh, internal return of return and then uh, the kv line railway line is also same like you know uh, you know you get that benefit okay yeah Uh, i would like to give the next chance to the uh, shakita kumar uh, kumar ge uh, can you uh, unmute and uh, present your question please Sakit, I can't hear you. Yeah, uh, he's not uh, unmute yet. Okay, I uh, will go for the uh, next question from the uh, chat board. Uh, the question is come from the Mohan. Uh, he asks, uh, how come do you understand this type of mass uh, transportation is needed by 2030, 2040, or 2050? People might be thinking about moving away from Kalambo area by 2050, for example. yeah this is a hypothetical situation you know we can we might be thinking people would leave, move out of colombo but this has not happened for the last uh, you know 30 40 years people have been moving out of the center of the colombo because it's not affordable they have been moving uh, to the outskirts that which has resulted in needing more and more mass transport into the city right because our job market is still in the city you won't you won't take away the city like you know you won't take like you know we were trying to move out the uh, the the job jobs or the official work, office works from the central part of colombo to batramul what happened more more jobs came into the more uh, you know officers came into the the place spaces that was vacant so colombo will never be a empty space people will start we will always want to come and travel live in colombo so i think uh, uh you know long term planning as 2040 and 2050 is it's, it's actually re really beyond the technological uh, level as well where maybe the you know the different things autonomous vehicles will coming and so on but 2030 is is something to, to usually we look at this 20 year horizons and i think to tackle our the problem we need the transport mass transport and um, you know uh, the hypothetical thinking that people will move out of colombo has not happened uh, so far 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, uh, Dr. Dimat, are you okay? Because now one, uh, uh, one hour, 20 minutes has gone already. Are you? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm okay. Okay, I'm to, okay. Yeah, okay. As long yeah, as uh, people are okay to stay on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, I'm not sure whether Sakita is still, uh, if you want to ask you a question. Um, if we, until he ready, I will get the next question from the board. Uh, Upali Pereira is asking, uh, appreciate your effort and work, uh, working for LT plan to overcome this uh, burning issue. Uh, enough proofs to kick off your proposals can be found in all developed countries right now. Uh, uh, countries Right now, do you see any sign to reactivate the discussion? Give me a minute. Uh, the decision maker, yes, I can see the. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so and I think uh, LD, yes, LD yeah. plan uh, is talking, Upali, I think he's talking about the LRT. Uh, of course, uh, it's a needed project. And um, unfortunately, I don't see uh, it being restarted. There have been some talks about, uh, you know, talking with Japan to get the funding back. Uh, I think uh, it's not the biggest, uh, it is not the biggest need now, right now. So, uh, but if we can secure that money, if we can restart, of course we should be restarting. The reason is, it's not something that will have an immediate burden on the country. Why? Uh, if the IMF you know, negotiation is not going to be impacted by that, because we don't, we don't have to pay anything until uh, 12 years, right? 12 years, it's a grace period. And also it will actually boost the construction industry, which is kind of in a, in a big problem right now. Um, you know, there, there is uh, about close to about 42% actually is going to retain uh, in to, for like to 40 to 50% are going to retain in the country uh, of out of this uh, funding, right? You know, so that is going to come into the economy of the people of the job industry. So actually, the reactivation uh, hopefully can be done, but uh, you know, uh, at the moment, uh, whether it's affordable for us is is the question. It was affordable to us, uh, you know, a couple of years back, and it should have moved forward. But unfortunately, at the moment, uh, whether we can take loans is it's a decision that the financial institutes, like the the treasury, has to take. What are the priorities? whether what are the implication of taking other loans and so on but definitely we have understood that we can we can get economic benefit because construction is only take only three to four years uh, and we'll have about seven years of operational and economic benefit before we start paying for that infrastructure okay right. yeah, thank you uh, the next question is from uh, Nalaka Senivaratna he, he asks, uh, will Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan uh, ride on public transport services park in their vehicle, even having luxury public transport services? Uh, and uh, shouldn't change their mind, habits, and ethics? Yeah, I think uh, well, very valid. And this is all got to do with the, with the people's behavior, people's thinking, right? Uh, at, at this point, Yes, people are ready to put their vehicle on, on a parking lot and go because no, no fool, right? So at the moment, yes. But uh, the idea behind was actually not targeting mostly the car users. It was actually targeting the motorcycles and cyclists. They can, uh, the motorcyclists mainly because a lot of people who moved out of the, the, the buses, uh, like you know move out of the buses or the train actually went to motorcycle not to the cars most of them and it's a it's an unsafe mode of transport and you can't expect them to just discharge they like discard their uh, the, the the motorcycle so this is where we can provide and what we expected was that they will actually use the bicycle to get to the station and park and ride and uh, the of course uh, this is where we were looking at drop and drop off and go, uh, where we can the people can drop off and go. Not only parking, but those facilities are important. I I, I agree to a certain extent. Uh, a person, uh, you know, parking the vehicle for uh, in in can be and can, can has to be looked into. 
and uh, we have done some studies to look at it and it shows that uh, as long as there is security th there's one of my students actually doing a study on this I, I have seen I see him on this forum as well uh, so once once we complete the study we will actually find out how people would behave how would they would think about uh, you know keeping their vehicle and using the park and ride services yeah, thank you. Um, the Shakita, I uh, I unmute you. You can uh, now yeah, present uh, your question. Thank you, Percy, for unmuting me. And uh, thank you, Demanda, for the nice presentation. And I have some questions regarding not the transport planning, of course, because I'm quite aware about the, what's happening. So in order to update what's happening in Australia, I think it's quite important that last week, uh, in Australia, we uh, released the Adelaide Railway electrification, which is about 42 kilometers, which cost around $842 million. And there are similar such projects in um, Brisbane as well, the Cross River project, and in Perth, I guess. So these projects run because of you have proper planning. But my question comes here. In the first part of your presentation, you suggested that several planning projects projects were jeopardized by certain people and the relevant professional organizations were advocating that. Don't you think that there should be ethical review or conduct in order or by IESL or any professional body in Sri Lanka to avoid such things happening in future? That's my question. Okay, thank you, Sakita. A very valid question. And um, thanks, Sakita. And you know, he's my co-founder co of my Emprada software that I've talked to you about. You know, uh, good to see you on the forum. Um, yes, I think this is the problem with Sri Lanka. And I think there, there, there is a lot of um, uh, you know, uh, unprof like you know, ethics are, is in a question. You know, you know, when you're working in Canada or in Australia, when a consultant is provided with a, with a, uh, with a task, none of the other consultants would intervene. There's no right for other consultants. It's not ethical to intervene. What, what do you see in Sri Lanka? When, I, I, when my team and myself were given a task to do the master plan, you see another set of consultants uh, compete in trying to say the wrong things about it go behind the uh, the ministers go use the uh, institutions like uh, IESL and other organizations to kind of uh, show the importance of it and actually these are really violation of the ethical code of of IESL I see right so I think uh, if a consultant is not doing the right job I think uh, a person the IESL should the professional body should take action against a person not doing the right job. It should not be allowed to the other academics or other people to kind of uh, intervene and jeopardize, right? So good example is the Kalini Valley line that I spoke about. Uh, IESL interfered, I would say, and, and they are totally responsible for that. So transport committee should be actually i suggest that iesl actually look at this and find out because the the counter proposal given was not practical at all i will just give an example the Kalili valley line counter proposal saying that you can reduce the cost by a certain amount was with a gradient of six percent it was absurd to hear uh, as an engineer from a set of senior IESL engineers coming and giving a proposal with a 6% gradient of railway. So, you know, and when, when I, even IESL members ask for a report or detailed calculation, they have not, they have yeah. failed to provide this to the membership, right? So I think, uh, you know, the responsibility has to be taken. And I think it's a very valid question, Sakita. I think we had to start the accountability. Because in this country, I have seen, uh, 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 you know, a, a medical doctor talking about, uh, uh, you know, organic farming, uh, uh, economic professor coming and talking about doing transport planning, uh, and, you know, the other people interfering. So the people who have interfered and given their advice, 
they should made made accountable and with that we will actually get things going and i uh, i think i think that is where we should start and that that is where the iesl actually can make a difference in the future thank you sakita um, thank you, Dimanta. Um, we have uh, three more questions. Uh, I think uh, um, if you happy, we can. I can probably. Yeah, sure, sure. We can go. Okay. On. Yeah. The next question is from uh, Ruan Idrisinga. Uh, his question is: uh, With the present economic crisis, uh, how feasible the strategies you propose for short term, sh short term, despite the policy implementation issues? within bracket at least the uh, conversions of bus fleet into high quality bus network so uh, where 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 to best start um okay um, the question was can, can you repeat that question please yeah uh, with the present economic uh, crisis how feasible the strategies you propose for sh short term despite the policy implementation issues uh, within bracket at least the conversions uh, of bus fleet into a uh, high quality bus network right so uh, uh, i think very valid point uh, whether with, with the economic problem we have whether we have funding yes so the short term i think this is where we we, we are with the problem is now this is where the politicians look at they are looking at only short term solutions because they want something to be having within two to three years but are we getting the solution is it a band-aid only right so that is where we need to understand we can say we are going to put park and ride we are going to put like you know as a short-term solution I, we have given a lot of solutions to the policy makers saying that you know you need to short-term increase the number of trains you need to uh, have at least give us a park and ride facilities uh, you know try to uh, you know in upgrade the uh, you know the use the road system make it more efficient by updating signal times and so on right so but this solution is is not because we are want to take the congestion now it is because we are having a problem with our fuel at the moment right so i think uh, of course increasing the quality of the buses is an important factor and this is what we have said in our Ma megapolis master plan done in 2016 don't do these bus lanes don't do this uh, uh, brts don't do this uh, you know sahasara what you need to do is upgrade the quality of buses so that the people who are losing from the buses can be retained because we know the buses are already full okay so i think in the short term we had to use efficiently what we have uh, what what are what are the uh, the systems that we already have then we need to go to our different like if, if to the current problem we need to go to our traffic management or traffic demand management systems even in our traffic uh, master plan we had promoted flexible work hours back in 2016 we tried to start it in Batteramulla, but now it's a good opportunity to do it we, we are trying to go to the uh, you know compressed week of four days maybe we need to implement it for schools as well you know you know 20 to 30 percent of our trips are school trips during the morning right so then we can reduce that so we need to go to multi it's not only railway it's not only buses it's not only uh, you know cycling we need to do our you know give the solution with everything in in uh, together right thank you for that question yeah thank you Dimanta. Um, the next question is from Pradeep. Uh, he asks, uh, how about the extensions of marine drive up to somewhere around Panadura? Is it under the same planning? Yeah, the, the, I didn't go through the, the road, all the road network uh, expansions that we are planned. Uh, one of these marine drive extension was one of the, uh, one, one, one was under consideration. There was a feasibility uh, completed but what we found was uh, there is a huge cost uh, to uh, connect between Dehiwala and Maliban Junction because it has to go through a section where uh, to go uh, in front of the St. Thomas's College and also because of the Mount Lavinia Hotel. So to avoid that, uh, you need to go elevated in that section or go through the sea or tunnel. This cost was so high, 
it the the economic rate of return was very very low so it has to be decided whether you like you know if you can pass that part then you can go up to panudura not up to panudura it's actually up to morotua because from morotua to panudura we have the bypass already so this extension can be done but what we found part of the study was majority of the people who who use who come out from marine drive at uh, now at dehiwala it was at uh, Ma- uh, where was it uh, william junction before are actually going towards uh, uh, towards nadimala towards inner part of uh, belekade junction majority of actually ending their journey uh, there so what was actually required one of the uh, alternative was extension of the baseline road if the extension of the baseline road is done we don't need the extension of the marine drive but if marine drive is to be done then we need that funding uh, like you know that amount of money uh, with not uh, very high because the cost is really high or the other alternative that came up was okay let's see whether we can actually connect it uh, as a overpass connecting it over gold road to the kadavata road so that uh, you know people can cross to the other side and um, so that you know that section uh, can can be relieved so at the moment the feasibility is completed so it is up to the government to decide whether you know whether we are going to go ahead even though there's not high uh, economic return yeah uh, thank you dimanta uh, this will be the final question it's come from the australia kamal viratunga uh it's a long questions uh, anyway uh thanks for the interest uh, interesting presentations uh, have you presented plans to political decision makers and if so what was their response how much you plan will cost to implement that's the first one so then uh the next question is how can you be so confidently say that your plans uh, could solve congestions in colombo 10 years sorry if i sound too negative but i haven't come across any city that has been uh, able to resolve congestions fully no matter how much money uh, money throw at it in fact i am not even sure if solving congestions uh, is the right approach as of us to uh managing conditions thanks yeah. okay uh, very valid <coughs> i think the first one is about uh, political decision makers yes uh, this has been uh, you know not presented directly uh, i have tried to send this to the political hierarchy uh, you know not a person who goes behind the politicians so i don't if invited i'm ready to present it Uh, but at the moment uh, not directly to the higher right? but so i have presented this to the secretaries uh, so to some uh, you know some of the groups as well but uh, you know uh, the response uh, has been uh, initial response at, at this moment now oh, for, let let me break this answer okay the first one is like you know during the 2016 at that time it was we spent about one and a half years trying to uh, tackle the the what i call the sabotage group trying to uh, uh, block the lrt so it took one and a half years before we could actually start that and Hello. Can you hear me now?
Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Okay. Can hear, sorry. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I think um, uh, what I was trying to say is, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I don't like, you know, I like, you know, the, the response from the political side is, is very low. Uh, cost of implementation, yes, it's costly. Uh, initially, like the whole thing that we are looking, uh, we'll, we will have to reassess and see what the cost would be now. Uh, we were, the LRT was uh, initially cost at $1.4 billion, but it, we were able to reduce it to $1 billion US dollars after the detailed design. So any, any costing, we will only know after the detailed designs are completed. And then uh, uh, the, uh, the KV line is about 1.5 billion. So we are looking close to about uh, total about 10 billion US dollars investment if we are going to kind of build a total solution, right? So that is why I said, okay, maybe you're right. Now I'm giving you a solution as a, a complete solution. But yeah, we, we can manage with certain, right? If you can reduce by 50%, 60%, that's, that's I think, good enough. We can actually live with it as well. So uh, you are right in a way, saying that, okay, we probably won't completely solve the solution, but have a complete solution. But that is why we have computer simulation. We run computer models. We run computer models and we have tested how the road speeds are changed. And we have put this into, and that is what we should be doing. And the, you know, that is something that I am, I have done a lot while I was in Canada. Uh, we had done these kind of uh, sophisticated modeling work, and we, uh, and before we, you know, plan anything, we should run it, and we should see the future and see, okay, whether actually we are, we, we are getting kind of an outcome. So I think uh, that is why I'm confident in saying we can relieve the condition, uh, you know, completely. When I say complete, it's you're right, it's a relative word, right? You know, wh what do you mean by congestion? Is it at when the roads are going at 20 kilometers per hour or is it at 30 kilometers per hour? So, uh, you know, I think it's when people feel that uh, you are not wasting time on the road and you have that high reliability as well. Right. Okay. I can't hear you, uh, uh, Percy. Can you, hear me now? can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, okay, uh, sorry for that. Um, I think the question is over now. Uh, I think uh, we have almost spent uh, one and 40 minutes. Um, this is time to finish our session. Um, yeah, on behalf of, uh, I think, I think uh, you are, uh, let me to check whether any questions from the chat board. No, so yeah, that's all, yeah. Um, I'm going to finish this session uh, on behalf of our IESLWA chapter and webinar organizations team. Uh, it's my privilege to propose a word of thanks on this occasion. Uh, my heart feels that with a lot of gratitude and respect uh, for our distinguished uh, guest speaker, Dr. Dimanta Dissimna, uh, for not only uh, sparing his valuable time for us, uh, uh, to grace the occasions, uh, but also for enlightening us with uh, his commendable talk uh, on the subject. Thank you very much, Dr. Dimanta. You have indeed put the uh, best of your efforts to make this uh, event uh, unforgettable. Thank you again for the answering uh, all the questions uh, presented as well. Um, I'm uh, running short of uh, words to express uh, in my humble thanks to uh, ISLWA committee, ISL uh, Co Corporate Communication Department in Sri Lanka. A uh, big thanks for the participants uh, who joined uh, today with us uh, via webinar. Yeah, yeah, this is a very great uh, presentation. Uh, it was a pleasure to have all of you. Uh, yeah, with this, uh, I conclude uh, the webinar. Thank you all for attending. Hope you all have learned and enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.